Welcome to the daily Glasgow Cappuccino. Start each day of COP26 by drinking in a few minutes of warm, stimulating conversation about climate resilience. I'm your host, Peter Willis from The Resilience Shift. Shall we begin? My guest on this morning's Cappuccino is Wanjira Matai. Wanjira is the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. She was for many years chair of the Greenbelt Movement, the movement that her mother, Wangari Matai, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, founded in 1977. Wanjira is currently chair of the Wangari Matai Foundation. In the run-up to COP26, Wanjira has been appointed a friend of COP. I'm speaking to her at her home in Nairobi, Kenya. So Wanjira, it's lovely to have you here as always. Thank you so much for joining this uh, Cup Cappuccino. You have spent a lot of time in the last year talking with colleagues around Africa, which is your territory uh, with the WRI. And I would be interested to know how your colleagues are talking about resilience and the challenge that's presenting to them. And what is the hope that they're bringing to Glasgow? Resilience is getting a lot of attention. It's getting good attention in terms of momentum, but COP26 will really be the proof uh, of the pudding to see if we're really serious about, uh, about res building resilience and certainly the adaptation agenda. A lot of my colleagues are concerned about the usual gaps that we've seen. We've seen significant gaps and therefore the signals that adaptation is important and central. So we've seen gaps in finance. We've seen absolutely very low commitment. I've even started thinking these are smoke and mirrors now. We are starting to see a certain amount of smoke and mirrors in how we account for adaptation finance, different people counting different things, pooling um, development aid back and, and, and counting it as adaptation finance. There is no solidarity or commitment to address the adaptation agenda. And that has been perplexing to many, especially those who live in this situation. There's a certain amount of urgency. Another issue that my colleagues and, and I are, are concerned about is just how all of this is um, jeopardizing the trust that must hold the, the Paris Agreement together. We cannot have a Paris Agreement that is only focused on mitigation. I've always been struck by the fact that when new NDCs were being submitted for the 2020 deadline, countries like Rwanda were the very first to put in ambitious um, NDCs, and yet they are amongst the lowest emitters. This is the sort of commitment that we are showing to the mitigation agenda. We are not seeing the same uh, treatment on or for adaptation. So we're feeling that this is the moment and this must be the COP where those issues are not only acknowledged, but the finance clear roadmaps are put in place. And certainly that we start to see the issue of loss and damage as a permanent item of discussion at the COP. What in your view is the the power beneath that loss and damage item on the agenda that you believe should be much more prominent now. Can you explain that to our listeners? We have almost um, been seduced into the whole mitigation agenda. We have to keep 1.5 alive. And implicit in that is almost that that's what's at stake. What we forget is that there is already a certain amount of emissions um, uh, locked in into the into the planetary warming that is happening and so some of that lock-in has got damaged and losses that are coming already so regardless of how committed we are to keeping 1.5 alive and we have to be we also have to acknowledge that whatever has been locked in will cause undue suffering that's what this is about it's about acknowledging that there is already some damage there is already some uh, warming going on that is part of the status quo and is part of what we will see regardless of the action we take and even how ambitious that action is. Because that locking is spelling doom for many countries, sea level rising, flooding, forest burning. So it's almost like there's a hole 
in the bucket. If we keep focusing on just filling this bucket and not plugging the hole, we'll never get there. And so there's a lot of damage that we have to deal with regardless of the action we take. And that's what that's about. And then is that uh, loss and damage an issue within the negotiations because there's an implication of liability that is handed to the, um, the global heavy emitting north? Well, there's a fear, right? That has always ah. been, I think, the fear that the implicit in loss and damage is an accusation that the rich economies must pay. Well, that's not entirely unfounded because I think there is a common but differentiated responsibility. Those countries that have been responsible for the emissions, 80% of emissions are caused by the G20. They must be responsible for solving and cleaning up that problem. But that's not what this is about. Loss and damage is about acknowledging the solidarity, that this is about all of us. Let's not forget many of these vulnerable countries are part of global supply chains. They're part of global value chains. We can't afford to have some of those countries uh, focusing on loss and damage on their own because it will affect our supply chains and our value chains. We don't have to be reminded about that, Peter. We saw it happen with, with uh, COVID and, and the, the entire disruption that happened. I, when I consider my own continent, uh, our continent, Peter, Africa, we think about the fact that from agricultural products like cocoa, coffee, tea, um, you know, all sorts of minerals, these are part of the African uh, supply chains that make it into the global supply chain. So that solidarity is what it's about. I don't mind that some people feel a deep sense of responsibility, they should. But I think it's important to remember that that's not the only thing on the table, that responsibility should also be coupled with the solidarity, that we are all in this together and that we cannot, um, and we, but we also have to acknowledge that some are suffering more than others. Thank you. Um, uh, that's really interesting the way you framed it, Wanjira. And uh, you're making me wonder whether the the cappuccino might not be the catalyst for the G20 to wake up to their solidarity and their obligations with the coffee growing parts yeah. of, of the <laughs> <Yeah>. world, <laughs> which tend to be in the global south. Um, I like the analogy. <laughs> no, no solidarity, no cappuccino. And no chocolate to go with it. No cappuccino. chocolate to go with it. Oh, oh! Now we're. This is getting very sensitive. I think there'll be enough people listening now. <laughs> I want to close, uh, Wanjira, with uh, just. To, I want to tap into your thinking ab about the mindset of someone who is properly switched on, in your view, to resilience, to this notion of resilience, which is under underlain what you just said. You're looking to the global north, the G20. Um, and you're in a way asking them to be fully switched on to resilience because if you were you would understand how we are positioned in africa and the global south so what what, what are the elements of that switching on of consciousness would you say around resilience at the moment the biggest switch on around resilience is that we should all be extremely uncomfortable with the lack of commitment to financing adaptation and the flow of adaptation finance. So even if it's finance, how do we make sure that it gets to the people who need it? I was just in a, in a conversation with Sheila Patel of Slum Dwellers International and nothing she hears gives her comfort. She sits uh, and watches communities completely disappear under flooding and landslides. And she's wondering why we are still talking. Like how does what we are saying actually make a difference on the ground. I mean, what sort of trust is there when you didn't meet the first five years and now we're supposed to be ramping that up. So we will be simultaneously calling for the backlog, but also looking to set much more ambitious. I think the number is 6.3 trillion a year that's needed for adaptation. So hundred billion is but a symbol of what's needed. What is the infrastructure we need to hasten that finance? And where is that finance to, to, in the first place? So I'd love to see some very anxious, uh, distressed uh, 
delegates of the G20 saying, surely we can't have this. Wow. Well, thank you, Wanjira. You couldn't have put it more passionately and clearly. Uh, and I really appreciate, as I always do, talking with you and hearing your thoughts about our present and our future. Thank you so much. And uh, enjoy the cup. And I hope you get a good cappuccino before the day is much longer. Absolutely. I will be enjoying the cup. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.